All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, and thanks for uh, having me uh, in this workshop. Um, so I've uh, given myself kind of a special mission this morning to uh, kind of tell you a story uh, uh, which is related to what I do for science, which is um, I work at INRIA, which is a national institution in uh, research institute in, in France, which focuses on computer science and applied math. So basically, when I don't do brain imaging, I tend to prove theorems and uh, write algorithms. But it's not really, uh, I think, the right time to go into details about this. For me, I will uh, speak this morning about a tool that has been, for me, a way to impact neuroscience and neuroimaging in general with the, I would say, proper science that I'm doing. I'm not saying that software is not proper science, but at least most people will claim it. Um, so the, the software that is going to be useful for my story, which hopefully uh, I will convince you, is not only an MEG or EEG story. This could be applied to different types of modalities, different types of applications. And this is just an example. So MNE is this uh, software. That, uh, so you have the URL that you see at the, at the top, which is, we say MNE, which historically stands for minimum norm estimates. Now we tend to say that's MEG and EEG. Uh, which is really a software to visualize, analyze, process, uh, and make sense of uh, brain waves. Uh, so mostly MEG and EEG, but now more recently with uh, invasive recordings with SEG or ECOG. So, uh, so far this is only a procedural data, but uh, as I will show you, there's uh, some uh, ongoing efforts to go more uh, multimodal and build uh, on top of this software. So just to tell you a bit what uh, um, MNE does and what's the, uh, the uh, kind of the scope. Um, so basically it covers the entire pipeline of MEG and data, uh, uh, MEG and EEG data processing. Going from pre-processing of the raw data, the different readers, for the different file formats, different vendors, um, and then basic styles of pre-processing for like filtering signals, applying some kind of uh, projections, ICA, unsupervised learning methods, uh, Maxwell filtering, which is a, a pure Python re-implementation of the commercial tool that Alexa provides, and also a bunch of visualization uh, things, time frequency, uh, including into uh, source space, and uh, also a lot of uh, um, machine learning, which is also what mostly I do for research. Uh, typically built on top of the software that I also wrote over the last 10 years with school of psychic learning. So one of the unique aspects of MNE, maybe I should say in this uh, landscape of open source software for brain uh, signals, is the machine learning aspects, machine learning aspects, which is pretty uh, uh, strong, I would say, in the MNE uh, code base. So these are the types of things that you can do uh, with MNE. So this is just a BAM model that you would typically obtain from the T1 MR of your subjects. This is just an evoke response. Uh, this is uh, types of graphs if you're interested in doing connectivity uh, using uh, MEG and EG signals. So they can do it in a sensor space, even though you should not do this, but you can also do it in source space. Um, and this, you have the time frequency map and, and different ways of reconstructing, either using, for example, here the SPM solution on the cortical surface, uh, or here a beamformer uh, that you can visualize on the 3D volume. So in terms of impact of, of m and &E, I would say there's a, there's a, we have users pretty much in, in, in everywhere in, uh, in the world. Uh, since uh, I, I update the slides depending where the talk is given. Um, so uh, the U.S. is clearly the place where you have, we have the most uh, visits on the website. Uh, and this is roughly the number of unique users that we've seen on the, on the website over the last uh, 12 months. So I don't, think, I don't know if it's impressive just uh, compared to Scikit-Learn, which is close to uh, uh, half a million users. Uh, this is 20,000, so it's slightly smaller. Uh, but I guess the user base potentially is, uh, is uh, much uh, smaller. Unfortunately, we need to sell more EG and energy systems, or rename it to Data Brain Farm. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, I will show you. I will show you a bunch of numbers uh, uh, along the way, and uh, try to also show how this is tied to a, a broader ecosystem uh, of, of packages. Um, so this is the, where the, the, the MNE code is uh, hosted. So this is hosted on GitHub, which is this uh, service that appeared pretty much online almost 10 years ago. Now belongs, that was bought by Microsoft, uh, I think last year or two years ago, uh, where we use, uh, that we used to develop uh, the package among different uh, um, people. So if I just comment briefly on these numbers, uh, 
here you have uh, the number of people who have basically forked the repository, which means that they've, they've made the code their own in order to update it and modify it. These are the people who are uh, liking the project. These are the number of people that are basically accepting to get an email every time there's a commit or a message on the project. So really that are following on a daily basis what's happening. And now you have this feature that you can also see on GitHub, which is how many projects on the ecosystem is using uh, your, your package. And you see that MNE is roughly used by 300 projects uh, in the, uh, I would say, Python world ecosystem. And a lot of these projects uh, recently are more and more using deep learning. Uh, I think one of the unique aspects of MNE Python is that it's written in Python and therefore can leverage some things like PyTorch or TensorFlow that is suddenly becoming very popular. And uh, I mean, it has become a go-to technique to uh, uh, package to, to do these types of things. So in terms of, uh, I would say, academic impact, uh, uh, it's important to uh, also give academic credit to people that spend their time writing software and try to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, so this, we wrote and uh, we convinced the, at that time, the NeuroImage editors to accept the software paper, which was not so uh, common at that time. Uh, so I remember having to uh, uh, argue with uh, Peter Babettini <laughs> uh, about uh, should it be okay or not to publish the software paper in NeuroImage, which is now uh, perfectly fine and, and, and recommended, and that now we have proper guidelines to do this. But I think it's important to give these types of academic credit uh, to people who are investing their time in writing software. So just to tell you a bit the, uh, the history of, uh, of the MNE code, uh, so basically I started to write the MNE Python in, in December uh, 2010. I was just arriving at ABGH as a postdoc uh, funded by an MNE brainstorm at that time, NIH grants. Um, and so I had not much to do during Christmas time. Pretty much MG, MGH and the Martinos was empty. And, uh, I needed to find something to do during my postdoc. And what's the best way to learn how to uh, use a tool by uh, writing it or rewriting it? Um, and this is how I started to write uh, uh, MNE Python, which was typically built, uh, was really built historically on the C code that was uh, that Matt Yamalainen that we see here with a professor at Harvard uh, and uh, uh, the MEG uh, uh, head at the uh, Martino Center in Boston. So MNE was started historically uh, by Matthew when he arrived in 2001, 2001 at MGH. And it took him five years to go from the project of having MNE to a, a project that could be used uh, by, the, by the world. So in 2006, he open sourced, or not open source, still not open source the C code, but he, he made the MNE C code uh, uh, available as binaries. And this is how MNE appeared in the, in the ecosystem, uh, which is pretty much also when uh, field trips started uh, in terms of, uh, of time scale. And so the, the Python version of MNE appeared uh, uh, five years after, so late 2010. So basically I've been maintaining this MNE Python code for uh, almost 10 years. So if you look in terms of uh, lines of code, it's uh, fairly large, uh, just to give you an idea of people using uh, Python is about half the number of lines of code that you would use for Matplotlib, which is the plotting library that everybody uses in Python, so it's fairly massive. More than half of the code is, uh, is actually code, the rest is comments. Um, and something I would like to stress is that uh, there's been a number of people that have been contributing to this code, which is part of the title of this presentation, which is how to bake a, a community-driven software. Uh, there's more than 200 people that have spent uh, time contributing uh, what they know uh, to MNE, sending code, uh, and not just asking questions in the mailing list. And so there's a, also a funny number that you can see on this slide, by the way, you can click on this link if you have access to the slides, uh, and you can, uh, you can look at the statistics of a bunch of software, and that will tell you a lot uh, about it. So if you're curious, you, you can explore these types of things. And, and they came up with this kind of fancy metrics which is how many years would it take to rewrite this entire software? Um, and what you see here is that tell you to rewrite the MNE Python code, it would take you 30 years. Uh, so the question I would like to ask and try to answer with you is, I mean, how do you um, write such a software? So I think I missed my transition. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, let me, before rephrasing the question, I would like to, to also remind that it's, it's pure Python. 
It's BSD licensed, which means that it's used, uh, it can be commercially used. So there's a number of startups that are using actually in, in their products. Um, I have grants and, 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 and contracts also uh, in France, thanks to m and &E by having collaborations with companies that are using this tool. And it's available on a, on a number of uh, uh, standard uh, operating systems. And now I can go to my transition, which is how you make uh, a software that would take 30 years to develop in nine years when you only have access to limited funding. So, of course, you need a bit of funding because you need, to peop you need people that will spend every day a bit of time uh, to work on this. So we've received over the years uh, a number of NIH grants that you see uh, up here, some NSF grants that I think uh, prior to my arrival on this project, which was really at the, at the level of the MNEC code, uh, there was also a bit of the German money at some point, and also some companies that you see, so Amazon give us, giving us a research grant to uh, host the data sets that we use for, for the examples. And also in France, so to the funding agency in France, also European money, so there are two ERC projects, including mine, that uh, ended up uh, investing uh, engineering time on M&E. And uh, also we've been uh, using since the last seven years uh, the opportunity that Google is offering us to, to fund students for three months during the summer to work on open source. And we typically have one to three students every summer uh, working on MME uh, through the uh, Python Software Foundation umbrella. And we also have a bunch of, uh, I would say, institutions that have been fine uh, giving us some of their money to the people that they are funding. Uh, so, for example, NYU has been uh, funding PhD students or postdocs who ended up being core maintainers of m &E for some time. Alto University is doing the same. University of Washington, which now benefits from an, an, an NIH grant, has been for many years one of the driving force of the development of, uh, of m and &E. Boston University, too, and also a lot, a lot of uh, structures in, in Europe going from interim in French to the, the MEG core uh, site that in Ulich. Uh, the group in Ilmenau, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, also with Chris Olgraf, who did a lot of things at, at the same time, and also in Alps. So these are all the institutions that rather than, uh, I would say, writing their own software on their, on their side, are saying, let's invest our money and our people in a tool that can be shared and collaboratively uh, uh, developed. So the funding is distributed. And now what is particularly interesting, and I, I, I'm really happy about this, is that now I see PIs around the world that are applying for grants in their own country to contribute to MME. Uh, so this is happening right now in the UK, where, where there's somebody who has basically said, I want to do this in MME, uh, and, and let's get the funding where, what's the best, where, where it's easy uh, for, for him uh, to be in the UK. So what, what, uh, what I would like now, to, to, to question is and try to answer it, why did it work? And hopefully I, I did not bore you too much by showing you how great M&E is, but now really try to get to, to, to nail certain types of take-home messages. So the first thing that uh, happened in the, uh, uh, in the story of the M&E software, and I think all of the software I've been writing, including Scikit-learn, is that before looking for users, uh, you should look for contributors. Uh, because users will drive you crazy, they will send you emails at every time of the day, uh, and it's much better to grow the community by having contributors that are also users, but really what you should look for at the beginning is a core set of, a core team of people that are dedicated to the project and also that will feel personally uh, engaged in it. In order to do this, the first thing that you need to do is to, you need to explain to them how to help you. Um, I think it's really important in the in the concept of, of open source is that when when I when I don't have to do the job myself, uh, it's uh, maybe uh, maybe I'm a bit lazy, but it really means that I succeeded in, in getting the job done. So the more I convince others to do the job, the better uh, uh, I think my job is, is done. So typically, contributing is uh, now a big part of the of the workflow that we're trying to teach and educate, which is really how to help and what are the rules and, and, and what to do and what not to do. Uh, how do you make this happen in real life? So this was uh, the course print that we did in, uh, in Boston uh, four weeks ago. So I was in, originally in the US four weeks, four weeks ago. And here you see Eric Larson, who's uh, 
been a, one of the driving forces of, of MME over the last years. Uh, and also a number of people, including people that you would recognize in this room, that will uh, team up for five days. And here you see two postdocs at the MGH that typically don't work a lot together, and they just pair program for five days uh, in order to do in MNE what they were uh, hoping they, they could have done before and ask the questions to everybody around. So this is what I call an unconference, which means that people arrive on the morning morning and there's no schedule. There's nothing specific to do. The people just have to do what you think is important and convince their neighbors to team up and to do these types of pair programming sessions. And usually the difficulty is to tell people to go to lunch and dinner because they are too focused and too uh, maybe happy to do this rather than writing emails uh, or writing grants or editing papers that uh, um, it works uh, reasonably well. And so this is typically in these moments where you're here, you have very important core developers of MNE, but you also have new people. So again, these two, these two girls here in, in, in front here are uh, not typically MNE contributors, uh, but uh, they were willing to learn, and now they start to contribute uh, uh, some bits and pieces. Um, and so here in this picture, again, you see some experts and some people are here to learn, and these types of code sprints is a good way, an excellent way of having contributors and not users. So I would say before doing educational courses, uh, code sprints uh, is uh, maybe something to consider. Uh, sometimes it's hard to justify to funding agencies or your institutions because, I mean, the fun thing is that everybody pretty much paid on his own grant money to come. Okay. So we've done some code sprints in, like five years ago. I, I had to find 10,000 euros to, to fly people there because they're not sure that there was a, a good uh, use of their money to come to Paris to work for one week on a mini. So I had to find the money, but now people, they pay with their own grant money to come. The other take-home message is uh, let's try not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, this is an important thing that is always more fun to rewrite uh, uh, his own thing rather than taking the time and uh, energy to uh, look at what others done and, and build on top of it. So just to give you an idea, what, so ME was not new. Uh, ME Python that you uh, pretty much uh, promote here is really built on the MNEC code, which has been written. Uh, it's just, I think the first line of code that you can track in the MNEC code is pretty much from the 90s because it's coming from Neuromag with the MEG company. So the Neuromag C code ended up being part of the MNEC code and the MNE Python code is uh, basically improvement, refinement uh, of this and extension. <clears throat> and also, uh, when I say don't reinvent the wheel and don't try to do everything, find a good scope, is that here we rely on Keysurfer for everything which is MR uh, related. Uh, and this is not our job. We let others uh, do this. This is not uh, what we're good at. So when you have this clear scope and, and vision, I think it's also easy uh, to tell people what's accepted, what is, will, what is uh, hoped in the software and what is not. And I mean, when I, when I get this question asked, I said, I mean, put in MNE what you think what other labs should be using. Okay, so try to invest time, not on the end of the pipeline, which is your fancy new tricks that you've added at the post-processing at a very late stage. Try to put there things that you think that are really mostly useful across different labs. And we, I don't have time to go into the details. We've, we've had a number of successes. And, and related to this, I would say the, the, the vision is not to implement everything because there are too many things happening uh, in the community. We, publish, we tend to publish too much. There's too many methods coming up every day. So let's not try to implement everything, but try to think, uh, try to uh, keep and, and what, what we think is the most important and let the 20% the, the uh, out. Another thing is uh, what I like to say, I uh, don't own the project. Uh, if you contribute to NME, &E, I, I guess we all have a, an ego more or less uh, strong. I think it's important that people who do the work get credit for this. So if you go to this page on MNE, you can see up to the last nine years who did what. Uh, and you see a number of names, you will see hundreds of names, and you will see uh, who contributed what feature. I think it's very important so that people can get credit. And also they don't have the impression that they work for MNE. Uh, the project, they work for them because they can put this on their resume, they can claim what they've done. And I know PR is also the getting positions in places, they use the fact that they contributed to MNE as a, a, a 
to make a point that they've done, so they've achieved some interesting stuff, and everything can be tracked and, 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 and checked. Another thing is that you should not try to own the project. So I try not to push myself forward, uh, or at least I, I, I try. <laughs> um, and also, even though MME was historically funded a lot in the US, a lot of uh, things are coming from the Martino Center. Uh, the Martino Center is one funding structure. Okay, the, it's the project is now hosted on MME.tools. It's not hosted on an INRIA URL. It's not hosted on a uh, Martino's URL. It's really something that belongs to a community and everybody gets credit for what it's doing. So what I like to say is that when we do open source, we're building the roads. So we are always very happy uh, to have roads. If everybody takes care of the road in front of his house, then the system works. And otherwise, if everybody tries to build his own infrastructure, it really doesn't fly. Uh, so when you contribute to something like open source, I would say think this way. Uh, try to build the road in front of your house and make sure that the road can connect with uh, what other people are doing, like other modalities in this context of today. How do you also scale a project like this when people are distributed all over the world? The key to do this is to make all the progress in the open. If you go to this page, this is what the ongoing pull request, so I think I think, uh, took this screenshot uh, two years ago, two days ago, and you see what's happening. Okay, so you see, for example, that somebody is working on years. Um, you see that uh, there's uh, improvements on detection of bad channels using Max filter, and here all the discussions related to these improvements are done in the open. We don't do this at the coffee machine because, I mean, the coffee machine would not be <laughs> easy to do when we're all like hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from from each other. But all these conversations and improvements, how things should be done, are done publicly, and not at the coffee machine, which is very good to have people also can jump in in conversation. So just give you an example. So Eric, after the sprint in, in Boston, said, talk to Olaf Hawk in the UK, in, in, in MRC in Cambridge. And Olaf is saying, the only reason I don't use Max Filter in MNE Python is because I don't have the Autobad option. So Eric said, okay, fair enough, I'll do it. <coughs> and so he does the implementation, and then I write this to Eric. which is basically, did you do homework? Did you test that this implementation works across many data sets? And I say, okay, Olaf, can you, can you give it a try? And so what's happening is that you have Olaf who's in the UK, he said, okay, I will do it. I will compare with the CamCan data, pinging a number of people, then it's in France, here it's in the US. <coughs> and then you have Marine who is in Auto, who takes the, the code and has a whole bunch of data sets in his uh, computer and write a tiny script that he put online in order to evaluate the performance of the technique. So suddenly you have a number of people that are teaming up in order to improve the automatic detection of bad channels. Um, and uh, I would say this is a better job than what most people would do in academic papers. Uh, because here you suddenly have the code and the actual results that are replicated <laughs> by many different people. And all this code again is reviewed and ending up with tools that, for me, are much more validated than, again, you, what you would find in most methods papers. How do you make this fly when we have limited resources? <coughs> Sorry about this. One way to make this review process um, scalable is to automate it. So we use a number of services, which is, by the way, a recent pull request to remove TMS artifacts using MME code. We have all these web services that are checking that the code is formatted properly, that the test flies, pass, that they work on all three systems, and all these, done, all these things are done completely automatically. And uh, I was saying to Aina uh, at some point that we should have linters and systems like this to check method sections in, in papers. Um, There's probably a bit, a bit more work. Uh, all right, continuing my long list of, uh, of take-home messages, is that we are in the world of brain imaging and neuroscience. I don't, usually our postdocs or PhDs, they are not 10 years, they don't have 10 years of experience writing advanced code in C++ or whatever low level language. And uh, maybe they've been well trained uh, using MATLAB code. So they don't let you know that you cannot write code in MATLAB and they should not do this. Um, and this is already a lot of things. But 
I don't expect people to know a lot more in order to contribute code, or at least we're trying not to uh, ask a lot more, which means that the technical difficulty of the code should be limited. <coughs> and what I say to people when they write code, typically the more they, the more they write programs, the more they're comfortable that they want to use advanced features. And I tell them, okay, imagine you have to read this code two years back when you started using the Python. Would you be able to read this code? And the answer is no. I said, then it's a problem. So I just tell them, just please write dumb code. And it's perfectly fine to write stupid code because that will help others take care of your code the day you go to industry uh, if this happens to you. Um, we try to also simplify the way people document their code. Uh, we use tools that allow us to build these types of example galleries. And this tool is this one, which is something called Sphinx Gallery, that was uh, actually started to be used by Scikit-Learn many years ago, was taken out of Scikit-Learn. And this is a way uh, to produce very nice example gallery of your software by just writing Python scripts. You put your code in the folder, you name it in a certain way, and basically we have a machinery that will build run the examples, capture all the outputs and the figures, and make a, an example gallery like this. So making a web page to document the code is not more complicated than writing a Python script. Uh, so it's really about finding the, 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 the incentives to people to contribute and make the, 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 the steps uh, as easy as possible. And along this slide, what we, what we can do with these types of example galleries, if you look at the very bottom of every example, you have a link, which is download the Python code or the notebook. And when you download this, this script or the notebook, what's happening is that if you don't have the data on your computer, it will download the data from Amazon or from OSF or from um, um, whatever service that we host the data sets on. It will download it and it will allow you to replicate the example. Okay? Uh, which means that I don't have to organize the data in a certain way. I don't have to get the data on Dropbox. I don't have to date. Everything is fetched, and you just download and run, and it should be uh, uh, replicated. In terms of communication, we try to do this like uh, stable releases every six months or every one year, which allows us to make the uh, tweets, and, and also uh, try to get some attraction for people to, so they can, they can feel also being part of the, of the, of the community. What is important to also realize is, uh, so I mean, he's uh, is great for what he's doing. Well, at least I'm convinced it's great for what he's doing, which is EEG and MEG. Uh, but he's relying on many other tools. Uh, so here, this is a, a, a slide that I stole from the web, where basically you have the core language, you have different building blocks. Uh, here's the like, package for machine learning, and really it's built on top of this ecosystem. And what I'd like to show is that this is, I mean, MEG is not the end of this circle. The idea is to build on top of this circle other packages and also having MEG use other uh, things from the neuroimaging ecosystem. Uh, so now this is the time where I talk more about the types of science that I can do uh, and, and not too much about recipes of how to make software. Um, but here's an example of a package that is not part of the MME code base. It's, for me, I see this as a plugin or a satellite project. And this is a tool that was done by one of my grad students who tries to automate the, the, the detection of bat channels and bat segments uh, in gene MEG. Uh, because we do a lot of, we tend to do a lot more population imaging these days. And we, when we need to process 200 subjects or 600, 650 subjects from CamCam, at some point we need to automate these types of rejections. <coughs> Another thing that we've been uh, uh, working on is uh, this idea of convolutional sparse coding. So I, I basically, on purpose, left uh, all the method out of this. Uh, this is a way to learn uh, the waveform shapes of, uh, of brain signals. Uh, it's been published in, at NeurIPS conference, which is a leading machine learning conference uh, for the last couple of years. And we make this project not part of the MNE code base. This is on separate satellite projects that are really built uh, on top of MNE. There are people also building BCI systems on top of MNE, there are people doing sleep scoring on top of MNE. Um, it's really, uh, uh, again, one, one core element uh, that, that, can, that can leverage what's below and hopefully help what is uh, uh, in its surroundings. Uh, another one, which uh, was I wanted to, I just added this morning uh, following the talk on that here yesterday. So this is more like a shameless uh, plug to something that's been working with the grad students for uh, the last few years. Uh, 
they were basically through the NAB ecosystem or the open science and open source world, people telling me we use ICA on NEG data and, and it takes 12 hours to run. Uh, and like, how is, it, how is this possible? And, and so me doing optimization and, and machine learning and doing numerics is uh, all the time, I would say for proper science, said, okay, let's look into this and see if we can understand what the problem is. And what turned out to be the problem is that all the ICA techniques, uh, uh, what typically in ICA techniques like Informax or extending Informax, they have this magic step size, which basically says how much steps you will do in the, in the relative gradient and when do you stop. And sometimes if these numbers are not proper, they can run forever. Uh, or you will run when you reach the maximum number of iteration. You may not even have an error message. It's just done. You think that it converged, but it did not. Um, and you have other techniques like FastSCA that is extremely efficient, but when you start to look at FastSCA, sometimes you run it on, on, on 200 subjects and you realize that for certain subjects, you get this did not converge error. Uh, and how, I mean, how is it possible? Uh, and I mean, can we understand how to do this? So this really triggered our interest to say, can we come up with an algorithm that fixes this problem? Uh, and just coming back to FastSCA, the, the, the problem of FastSCA is that, um, and I mean, general statistical models is when the assumptions do not hold, they typically flow. So if your technique works perfectly with the best on simulations in terms of running time, uh, if you start to break the model, you will see that things will slow down. And uh, FISTCA is impossible to beat when the model is perfectly independent. When you break a tiny bit the independence, sometimes it doesn't converge or it gets slow. But on simulations, it's impossible. Uh, so this is what we, we did with this technique that we call T-Card, which is preconditioned ICA for real data. It has nothing to do with uh, Star Trek for the fans in the, in the room. Um, and we basically showed that for EHMEG, we can get orders of magnitude faster solvers uh, to do exactly the same ICA types of things. Uh, so again, this is not the right time to, to mention this, but we use quasi Newton techniques. We use uh, um, limited memory uh, optimization, but uh, in the end, the, for me, the outcome is to show on empirical data that you can, you can get a huge improvement. And again, in this philosophy of open science, we made a, 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 a website, we made a Python package to do this, and you go to the example gallery, you click on examples, you have this code, and at the end of the code, you have a button, you click on the button, execute script, and when you execute the script, you see figures like this, which tries to replicate what you see in the paper. Okay, where well you see on this data that you can improve on by CCA in terms of running time. So, I'm continuing my list. Uh, so I'm not talking about bits because Robert will do it much better uh, afterwards, but we try also to build a satellite project to handle bits data sets on top of MME. And also for me, this is something quite important, is that we try to explain people how to write their own MME project. So on the MNE tool organization, you have something called MNE project templates. And so you go to this web page, you have this button, and you can click, click use this template, and it will just propose you to create a new project. You can name it the way you want. And you start from the project which is clean, which has the same types of organization as MNE, that can build these nice fancy galleries, uh, that can build this documentation that you can use for doing continuous integration. All these efforts of organizing these projects Hopefully, it's just one click away. Uh, so, this is also an advertisement for uh, things that is happening in this, uh, I would say, uh, Python world of, of multimodal imaging. Uh, in my team, also at INRIA, so the PySL team, there's a researcher that are uh, doing a lot of fMRI machine learning on fMRI, uh, so I'm thinking specifically about the, the director of the Paris Altimus Bertrand Thirion and, and, and our colleague, uh, Gail Larocco, who has been investing a lot of energy to build kind of MNE style project, or I would should say an, a psychic learn style project to do machine learning on MRI data. This is what the Nylon package is, is all about. And you can see MNE as the psychic learn uh, translated to MEG and EG world, Nylon is the same thing, and we try to clone this model for different types of application. Uh, so Nylon has the exact same organization, which means that if you know how to contribute to Nylon, you know how to contribute to MME. You know how to contribute to scikit-learn, 
all these projects are organized exactly the same, the same way of structuring documentation, same way of writing tests. And for me, this is a huge strength of the Python ecosystem, which means that if you know how to contribute to one Python project, you can fix problems in different places. Uh, just to give you an example, when Eric Larson finds the bug in MAE, for example, to doing filtering, a stability issue in filtering, what it will do, it will fix the bug in SciPy. If he finds the bug in SciPy, it will probably fix it in NumPy. And we have people in the team at INRIA that end up fixing stuff in CPython. Okay? So we try to have people fixing the things at the right level to impact as many people as possible. And if your problem is not specific to EEG and MEG, and your problem is a signal processing problem, this should be fixed in SciPy and should not be fixed in MEG. This is, for me, one of the biggest strengths of the Python ecosystem compared to other languages. Uh, and so also in this realm of, of uh, uh, um, uh, multimodal imaging, so Rob Luke, I discussed with you in the yesterday evening, uh, I started to use MME and said, I'm going to build my SNES uh, code on top of MME. So we discussed a bit how MME can or eventually should be adapted to support NIRS data. And after a bit of a conversation, this, we have this uh, Rob who is in Australia. Uh, and it's good because he works during the night for me. And uh, he spent his uh, time trying to uh, make examples using FNIRS data, collecting data that can be used both for training and for making examples, making sure that the readers for his uh, 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 file format are supported, that it's efficient, and he's doing all the work for us. We never wrote any grant to do FNIRS on top of any. We just told him how to do it, and he just does it. We're just giving a playground so he can do the job uh, say for us, but mostly for him, because he will get credit for what he's doing. So now it's time to kind of uh, progressively summarize. Um, and here I want to say that uh, um, I showed you a lot of things about open source and hopefully try to convince you that Doing open source is not dropping a Mata toolbox or whatever Python toolbox on your web page. There's, there's plenty of things that you should do and you should consider if you want this code to survive. A lot of things that I've showed you is learned from mistakes. I uh, did my PhD writing MATLAB code that is still somewhere on an INIA website. And nobody knows where it's there. Nobody knows how to integrate this in other packages. And this code is pretty much, I learned a lot of things by writing it, but it probably was a big waste of my time. So I, I kind of tried to learn from my mistakes. I tried to hopefully convey how you can prevent yourself or your students from make, making the same mistakes. But that's pretty much it for what I wanted to say about uh, open source. I would like to say a few things about more generally open science and open data. Um, so I'm now in charge of the Center for Data Science in the Paris Saclay. And so last year we organized also with Gael Barocco and, and Robert Soto at Institut Pasteur a challenge to predict autistic traits or autism from MRI data, and we made this challenge using this uh, uh, um, and there's a website that we used. Uh, to do this, there was eight, uh, 800 subjects that were publicly available, they were open data, and we used 800 subjects from the Hôpital Robert de Bray, which is a, a private hospital. Uh, and uh, what we said to the hospital is that the, your data will stay private because everybody will upload their code on our platform in order to predict uh, autistic or not. The binary classification problem. And so the interesting aspect is that uh, of, of this challenge, if you look on the public leaderboard, which is basically the performance that people would obtain on only 800 subjects, which is basically, uh, I would say 800 is already quite reasonable in terms of cohorts. Uh, people manage to get 100% prediction accuracy on cross-validation results. I'm going to repeat, on this challenge, 800 brains, people managed to have a cross-validation loop that would get 100% accuracy. When we look at the private data, so the, hospital, the data from the hospital, it dropped to between 65 and 70%. The people who won this challenge were roughly 80% on the public leaderboard and the private leaderboard. So it was so easy to overfit uh, on this challenge because 800 is large, but it's really not that large given the dimension of the data. 
And also the interesting take home message of this is that there's not a single deep learning technique which won. Techniques which won were just an ensemble of logistic regressions. Okay? Vanilla logistic regression, L2 regularized. You take a bunch of atlases, you compute the logistic regression. On every atlas, you average all this, and this is how you win the challenge. You probably will never be able to write any academic paper uh, to, if you do methods, and your method is just taking logistic regression. There's, there's very little chance that you can publish at NERC. But still, this is what we saw, and I think we need more of these types of initiatives in order to really denoise the literature that is around us. Uh, I see so much papers as editor, as reviewer, people claim that they can predict Alzheimer's at 97%, and they can predict, and honestly, do a challenge and, and see if this is really true, and see if you're the right person to do this job. It turns out that one of the person who won this challenge is my student who had never worked with, with MRI. He was basically working on sleep scoring on EEG. But he was basically well trained in what is to do cross validation, how to prevent overfit, how to control model parameters, and this is, uh, this is how he made it. So in this number of challenges, it's, I, I was briefly mentioning during the, the discussion uh, and the roundtable yesterday evening that maybe I'm not the right person to solve the problem. But if I can explain the problem to someone else, maybe they can fix it. Uh, so all these data challenges, sometimes they are won by the people from the community where the data comes from. For example, you have data challenges in physics that are won by physicists, but sometimes they are just won by you know, whatever programmer in what the random country, and this is how this is uh, successful. Uh, and so here, it was a huge effort. It was pretty much four or five months of full-time uh, for one of our engineers at the Tanner for Data Science to set up this challenge. And uh, he will get credit for having organized the challenge, and he's perfectly fine, and maybe because his ego is not big enough, but he's perfectly fine having other people solve the problem for him. Um, and I think we learned a lot by doing this. So on this uh, more concluding remarks, I'd like to ask the question, which is why do people contribute to open source? And why should you consider open source for uh, when you do science and when you want to make a progress in your uh, uh, field or your company, your business, whatever? I think it applies to scientists, but also in the, in the industry. For me, what is particularly important, one aspect, uh, is that you want to be able to innovate uh, without asking first. Okay, so you want to be able to start also where other people have stopped. So if you have open source code, you can start from something that is works okay, probably not good, enough, not good enough, you see the problem, and you can start from there. And this is really preventing us from stepping back. Uh, I've been working for probably too long, more than 10 years on the MEG EEG source imaging problem, inverse problem, uh, and I'm still completely annoyed that people compare their techniques to what was invented in the 90s. Uh, so when you, you see so many papers that are working on source imaging with MEG and EEG, and the only thing they compare is the first seminal work that was done 25 years ago. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, this type of open science and open source can fix this. Because I hear the argument that doing benchmarks is costly, it still takes time, my students don't have time, they need to graduate, and this is perfectly true. And now if it's becoming easy to do these types of benchmarks, to do these types of evaluations, then suddenly maybe it's doable, and maybe there's no good excuse anymore not to do any benchmarks when you do methods. Um, another aspect to this is that you can stay in control in what your uh, lab is doing. So for example, if your students are working on whatever, whatever data and whatever study, you can see what they are doing. You can pop, properly review what they're doing. Uh, and I found many bugs in my students' code. Sometimes after they graduate, when I want to share the code with other teams, I said, can we replicate your paper? And I send them the code, and they find bugs, um, which is sad. But um, I guess we all write bugs. But if nobody reads your code, then nobody's going to find out. And uh, I would say, I tend to say to people, just if you fix my bugs, I'm happy, OK? I will just feel bad at four seconds, but then I will be happy because then suddenly somebody will just do the job for me. And you can also influence the global ecosystem. So 
this is more a, a statement for industry, but uh, um, something we also uh, I find super interesting about open source is that if you look who, who has power in these types of projects, it's not the person who has the money, it's not the person who has the biggest ego, it's the person who are doing the job. And for me, I mean, I, uh, I take responsibility for a certain number of decisions and m and but another, a number of other people like Eric Larson, for example, they are perfectly fine making these types of decisions, and if Eric said it's okay, everybody says it's okay. Because after spending years writing this software, he owned the right to say this is correct, this is the way to do things. And what I like very much about open source, and I think something that uh, us scientists are also usually super enthusiastic about, is this, this notion of meritocracy. You get recognition for what you do and what you've achieved, and there's no, uh, there's no law of power. It's really by doing your uh, the job uh, and that you get the the credit from the community and you get this role of maintainer and the role of decision uh, about what uh, what should be done. So now this is the the positive aspect. Uh, the negative aspect is more related to this. Uh, if you look in the Python ecosystem, uh, we pretty much rely on. Uh, we think for what we do when we do data science or data processing, we rely on NumPy, which is this, uh, this array-oriented processing uh, that basically was invented 15 years ago. Uh, um, and you realize that uh, although there's a number of people uh, involved, that this is pretty much how much it would cost to rewrite this, so $8 million. This is the size of the code base. In practice, there's six people that are being uh, uh, maintaining this. Some of these people are just spending on their week, their evenings, their weekends. Some of these people are paid full time. And in Pandas, you have four, which is, again, not too much, although they have hundreds of contributors. And so what is the take home message of this uh, slide is that uh, uh, we need also to fund people who make this community possible uh, in companies, in academia, and there's been a number of initiatives like the Center for Data Science at NYU, the BIDS, uh, Berkeley Institute for Data Science, has been paying people full-time to support this ecosystem. Uh, I pay engineers and I found grant money uh, for uh, paying engineers to contribute to this ecosystem and not directly to what I want to do. I prefer to pay, to tell my students how to do this themselves and let my engineers contribute to uh, the, the ecosystem. Uh, so this is now the m &E people who have been working over the years. I'm sure I missed a few of these. And this is now my concluding slides with a bunch of logos. So of course the logos of the funding agencies that have been supporting me uh, over at the, at the Martinos in France and in Europe, but also all these projects and also all these companies uh, uh, that make this work possible. So it's, it's really important to realize that without GitHub, which is a private company, or without Travis, or without Abveyor, or without Anaconda, which are basically profit-oriented structure, they want to make money, but still they contribute to the ecosystem and they allow us uh, to do uh, um, what we do. And, uh, uh, and so I'm very happy that we have these tight uh, links between uh, what we do in academia and this uh, industrial uh, problem. And I think that's it, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. We have time for one short question. Good, okay. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to say I do not actively contribute to the GitHub community. I haven't used this much. However, um, what is the policy if people are to reuse these code snippets in applications that end up in commercial products? So, you know, you, you kind of pick and choose from somebody's got a nice power spectral density thing and somebody else has a nice visualization tool, and I would like to bundle these up to make something de novo, which I'd like to sell. So it's a choice of a license. Scikit-learn is BSD, Nylon is BSD, the entire Python stack is BSD, and it is BSD, which means that if Philips or EGI wants to use MME in their products, they can do whatever they want. It's, 
it's, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, you have these different notions of licenses, and typically you have licenses that if you use this code in public in private codes, all the code becomes public. You have this notion of viral licenses. Uh, but BSD or MIT or Apache 2, Apache 2 are now becoming the standard in data science, and there are codes that you can use even in commercial products without uh, contributing to that. But I would argue that if, if we don't do this, then we, we prevent ourselves from having interesting collaboration with industry. I have grant contracts with, part, with industrial partners. I've got my students that also are funded by private companies and for certain projects. And, and if CycleCurrent is now funded, Heisman is, make, is, is getting half a million donations every year by private companies, and this would not be possible without the license. But there, that doesn't actually create a mechanism by which the author of the code could ever get returns from the commercial productization of their work, is that right? Uh, it did, that's, that's true. Uh, the, the question is, what do you want to do? Uh, why, why are you doing things? Why, why are you doing this? Uh, if, if, you, if you do this because you want to contribute to... Uh, I, mean, I can tell you why I'm doing these types of things and how I managed to convince whoever institution I've worked on that they should adopt this. If you want to create, if you want to make money on the type of things, you need to think about a, a careful business model. Okay, you can sell a service, you can sell consultancy, uh, and I think uh, you cannot win on every, uh, on every aspect. But the, the fact that you will keep your, your code closed, I mean, I also at some point said, okay, I'm gonna write some closed source code and, and, and to sell this. The reality is that I don't have time I have 10 people to manage in the lab, so I may have some great ideas, but by taking this code private, this code is still on my hard drive, and nobody ever saw it. So, it's, I mean, you need to make this specific decision, and typically, I mean, is not really, I see this as the road, okay? So, you want to make sure that the roads are easy to do, and then people can make money by having trucks in the road. I think we're going to have to continue on uh, just to stay on time, but uh, we'll come back to this topic during the roundtable. Um, so, thank you very uh, much. Give another round of applause.